Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. We're just going to give a few more minutes for um, a few more participants to join, and then we'll get started. Okay, well, I think we should get started. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our Canadian History webinar on Artona. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm the Canadian History Specialist at Explorica. I'm Megan, and I'm the Territory Manager in British Columbia, and I've had the privilege of working with Zach in the past, actually. Um, I'm coming to you from Vancouver, which I would like to acknowledge is the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. We are very pleased to welcome social studies teacher Zachary Kavassan as he shares important stories from his master's thesis on the social interactions between Canadian soldiers and the Italian civilian population before, during, and after the Battle of Artona. Throughout his studies, Zach spent countless hours undertaking research and interviewing Canadian veterans and Ortona locals who lived through the conflict um, and we're able to help um, Zach in his research better understand the collective memory and experiences between the two groups. So welcome, Zachary. Thank you for having me. Um, so I think we're actually going to get started with a video, uh, which is about, Zach, would you say seven, ten minutes or so? I think it's around seven minutes and... 50 seconds or something like that. And it's a, uh, it's just an official um, Canadian Army newsreel uh, video on the Battle of Artona. So it is a little bit rough, but you got to take into the context that it was filmed in 1943. 
All right, everybody. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I was just introduced. My name is Zachary Cavison. I'm a history teacher at Elphinstone Secondary School in Gibsons, British Columbia, and it is my pleasure to be presenting to you all today. Today's presentation repre represents some of the elements that made up my master's thesis when I was a graduate student at the University of Ottawa. Now, before I jump into my presentation, I thought it was important to give you a little context on why I'm studying a part of Canadian military history, history that prior to 2008 had received very little attention. I first became acquainted with Artona when I was 16 years old. At the time, my father had been posted to Italy through a joint position with Foreign Affairs Canada and the Canadian Armed Forces as the head of security for our embassy in Rome, the same embassy that my father's parents had immigrated through to start a new life in Canada 50 years prior. My father, being a serving member of the Canadian Forces, as well as being first-generation Canadian from Italy, was very encouraging of my interest in both Canadian and Italian history and the periods in which both countries became interconnected. I remember him giving me Mark Zulke's book, Ortona, Canada's Epic World War II Battle, and after finishing it over a two-week period, he surprised me with taking me on a little road trip to Ortona to visit the site of the battle. Neither my father nor I had been to Ortona before, and this was at a time before Google Maps. So when we actually got close to approaching the town, we stumbled across a sign indicating the turnoff to the Morrill River Cemetery, where 1,615 Allied soldiers lay resting, 1,375 of which are Canadian. The location leaves one with a feeling of awe, as it's located no more than a few hundred yards from the Adriatic Ocean surrounded by farmland, and in the distance, one can see the ancient town of Artona. I don't think anyone can, can prepare you for your first experience visiting a Commonwealth cemetery. Seeing the vast number of tombstones, the varying ages of those who died, and seeing the numerous inscriptions, and in life loved and in death honored, forever remembered by his family. He gave his life so we and others could be free. Your body lay in Italy, your heart in Canada, and your soul onto God. What struck me out, what struck out to me was the diversity of the regiments that have soldiers laying to rest there as well. The Cape Breton Highlanders, the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, the Saskatoon Light Infantry Regiment, the West Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia Regiment, the Royal 22nd Regiment known as the Van Dues, the Royal Canadian Regiment, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, the Loyal Edmonton Regiment, the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, and the Three Rivers Re uh, Tanks Regiment, just to name a few. The fighting that occurred south of Artona and in Artona itself had regiments involved that originated from across Canada. My first encounter with an Ortonese, a person from Artona, was the Commonwealth Cemetery Gardener, who gave us a tour of the graves and talked about some of the individuals who were buried there. He knew so much about some of these men, and when we asked him how he knew about them, he was too young because he was too young to witness the battle, he stated that many family members of those buried had visited over the 15 years he had worked there and shared what they knew about their fathers, their uncles, cousins, or grandfathers that never returned home. While others he knew through locals of Ortona, Ortona who had developed relationships with some of these men before they were killed. Other Ortonese who we, who we met that day shared stories of the Canadians as well. As they were billeted in their homes or they worked for soldiers after the town's liberation, my dad and I were actually taken back by how many stories people had about interacting with Canadian soldiers. It was an experience that stuck with me. I remember soon after calling my grandfather, my nono, sometime after, and trying to engage him on the type of Allied soldiers that had entered his village and area during the war. My family is originally from the northeastern part of Italy and thus was one of the last areas liberated. He only remembered that they were Inglese, English, because he heard them speaking English and by the type of uniforms they wore. These soldiers literally spent no time in the village and they were in hot, because they were in hot pursuit of retreating German and fascist, fascist Italian forces. I would later discover when undertaking research at the Library and Archives of Canada, that those soldiers were actually members of the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and that I myself am a descendant of Italians liberated by Canadians during the Second World War. Thus, when I began to write my thesis research proposal to the University of Ottawa's history department, I thought it was important to shed light on the interaction between, interactions between Canadian soldiers and Italians and to discuss the role the Canadians played in Italy as both liberator and occupier to a former Axis power. In a country that had been under a fascist government for 21 years prior to the Allies' arrival to the Italian mainland in September of 1943, 
Ortona being the location of Canada's biggest battle of the Italian campaign, as well as the location where the Canadians spent many months after the battle recuperating and integrating reinforcements into their regiments became the logical focus of my research. Next slide, please. Now the battle occurred between December 20th to 28, 1943. Fighting in the town itself occurred between elements of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division versus elements of the 1st German Parachute Division. The battle included fierce street to street and room to room fighting. Canada suffered over 2,300 casualties with over 500 being fatal during the fighting in the town. Next slide, please. Now, when the Allies landed on the mainland of Italy on September 3rd, 1943, the Italian government had already signed an armistice in secret to protect the King of Italy and his family. The Royals fled the night before the invasion of main, the mainland Italy by traveling from Rome to the seaside town of Artona, where they boarded a ship and escaped. The locals of Artona only found out the following morning that their king had been present in the town as they had left all their cars along the port when they boarded a ship for Allied controlled territory. Even before Italy surrendered to the Allies, Germany sent over 250,000 additional soldiers to occupy Italy and establish a defensive position, as well as to disarm Italian armed forces. Albert Kesseling was placed in command of all German and fascist Italian forces in Italy. He established multiple defensive lines to slow the Allied advance. These defensive lines were established from the west coast to the east coast of Italy and were placed around natural defensive lines, mountains, walls, fortifications, and even rivers, anything that was not easy to pass. Next slide, please. Now, Artona represented one of Kesselling's lines of, of defense with a lateral road, my apologies for the state of the image, it's the only map showing the lateral road I could find, connecting Ortona to Rome. The American forces were advancing from southern Italy along the west coast and the British army, which the Canadians were part of, traveled from the south along the east coast. The Allies did advance through the central southern region of Italy as well, but the coasts were very important. Firstly, they weren't as mountainous and thus easier to advance along, and secondly, the Allied forces could be easily reinforced and supplied from the coast via the US and British navies. The Allied forces found that Ital Italian infrastructure that remained after the hundreds of bombing runs of the country prior to invasion made supplying and providing transport to forward divisions in some cases almost impossible via the roads and donkey paths that were available. Thus utilizing the sea and port cities was the most strategic approach to achieving further advances against the German forces. Ortona's importance was threefold. The first being that it was the established East Coast anchor and Kesserling's defensive line against the Allies in the fall and winter of 1943-1944. By breaking into that line, it would force the Germans to establish a new line of defense. Additionally, Ortona contained a deep sea port in which large Allied ships could dock to provide supplies and reinforcements for the British Eighth Army. And thirdly, with a population of over 20,000, Ortona was big enough to house and quarter an entire Allied division over the winter. Something that every Allied soldier desired in Italy was a warm shelter away from the cold and rain, as the term sunny Italy was a running joke amongst Allied soldiers because during the fall of 1943, Southern and Central Italy saw some of the heaviest rains and subsequent flooding in over 20 years. Next slide, please. Because of the town's strategic importance, the Allied Air Force did not bomb Ortona. It was hoped that the town would stay somewhat intact as well as most of the port. In almost all circumstances, the defending Germans had always left highly populated centers when their defensive lines had broken. Eighth Army Command expected the Germans to booby trap the town as well as damage the port, but thought that they would tactically fall back when the Canadians were on the outskirts. This was not the case. Ortona was being defended by the 1st Regiment of the German Parachute Division. Crack soldiers, well-trained and with lots of combat experience. The regiment had served in Poland, the Netherlands, France, Denmark, Norway, Crete and Russia prior to being transferred to Italy. Of the 20,000 Canadians in the town, about half fled south before the Canadians were at Ortona's gates. Some went north and others stayed in their homes in hopes that the fighting would just pass. The fighting south of Ortona was heavy as well and included tank fighting, hand-to-hand -hand combat and large-scale engagements between various regiments of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division and the German 90th Panzer Grenadiers. Some of the regiments that saw action south of Ortona included the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and the Royal 22nd Regiment, known as the Van Dues. The defending Germans in Ortona were ordered to hold the town at all costs. 
They blew up buildings throughout the town to block off roads so tanks could not enter side streets. They laid over 5,000 mines around the town and set up machine gun and sniper positions in selected areas that they had designated as killing zones. The Royal Edmonton Regiment and the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada, with the support of tanks, were tasked with taking Ortona. The fighting that ensued was some of the deadliest seen during World War II for Canada and was one of the first urban combat operations experienced by Allied soldiers. The town's defensive stance forced the Canadians to undertake a type of warfare that they had never embarked on before, urban fighting. To avoid the killing zones, the Canadians performed mouse holing to advance through the town. Mouse holing was blowing holes through the sides of buildings so that the troops could advance through the town via adjacent buildings without being in the open streets. This form of fighting was so new for the Allies that during my research, I found documentation that the urban fighting and mouse holing tactics used by the Canadians during the Battle of Artona were referenced in US Marine and US Army urban fighting training manuals until 1956 as well as British and Canadian Army tactical training manuals well into the 1960s. Next slide, please. Historians and military experts have always looked at the battle from this tactical perspective because it was such a unique battle and one that valuable military lessons were learned in relation to urban warfare. Of the 700 plus pages written by Canadian Army historian, J.W. Nicholson and his literary creation, The Official History of the Canadians in Italy, he provides numerous pages of information on the fighting in Ortona, with only two specific references to interactions with Italians found hiding in their wine cellars. But the condition of the town after the battle also created a unique, unique situation for the Canadians. The town was badly damaged. The 1st Canadian Infantry Division and elements of the 2nd Canadian Armoured Division were too depleted to advance further after the fighting that occurred. Soldiers needed rest and reinforcements to continue their advance. Ortona was thus still designated a rest and recuperation location for the Canadians after the battle, even though its condition left a lot of work to be done. In the slide, you can see both civilians walking amongst the rubble and Canadian soldiers helping elderly women navigate around the town. Next slide, please. A large portion of the civilian population had evacuated south of Ortona before the fighting occurred. Many dug into caves to hide and protect their families until the fighting had passed them, as seen in the photo. There were initial interactions between Canadian soldiers and Italian civilians throughout their advance. Some interactions were negative and some were positive. Although the Italians had signed the armistice in September 1943, many were still loyal to Mussolini. The Royal 22nd Regiment actually encountered and fought fascist Italians in San Leonardo, which is just south of Ortona. It was noted in their regimental war diary that Italians defending the area south of Artona demonstrated their last political act. Unfortunately, Corporal Vallet also died in the exchange of fire. As such, although the Canadians felt sorry for the civilian population that they encountered, they usually kept the safe distance in combat zones because they did not know who they could trust. These challenging encounters did not just occur against the Canadians. Two Ortonese I interviewed had difficult first encounters with the Canadians as well. The first was Franco Deodamo, who was 11 years old at the time. His mother had just passed away and his father was wearing black out of mourning. When the Canadians came to their house on the outskirts of town, they wanted to shoot his father on the spot for being a fascist, but were persuaded otherwise by family members present that the black was he was wearing was because of the loss of his wife. Even so, the Canadians set off a dozen rounds at the top of the house before leaving although no one was injured. Lanfranco Berardi, whose home is the famous site of Casa Berardi, where Captain Paul Turquette's actions resulted in him being awarded the Victoria Cross, was nine at the time. And his family, fearing that their home would be ransacked by either the defending Germans or advancing Canadians, refused to leave, and as a result, were fired on multiple occasions during the storming of their home. Other experiences were more positive. Tommaso Cespa, who has been a volunteer at the Battle of Ortona Museum for at least 20 years, as he was there when I went to Ortona the first time, referenced that his father was badly wounded by shrapnel from an artillery bombardment and that the Canadian medics actually saved his life. The 1st Canadian Infantry Division had their own refugee control officer that worked on evacuating Italian civilians from combat zones. But it was an overwhelming task, as the Germans would usually confiscate all food and materials from Italians before sending them towards Allied lines. The Germans would tell the Italians that the Allies would take care of them. 
Canadian Army intelligence noted that the masses of starving Italian refugees toward Allied lines as one of the tactics used by the Germans to hamper the Allies' advance. Many Canadian veterans I interview, interviewed noted that it was extremely hard to distinguish between friend and foe amongst the Italian population until Artona because of being constantly on the move. Still, they were empathetic to the Italian refugees' plight. Lieutenant Farley Mowat stated, the Italian refugees were something I had never seen before as I witnessed them in little clots and clusters trudging along the roads. They were clad in unidentifiable scraps of black rain-soaked clothing and many walked barefoot in the mud that was barely above the freezing point. Next slide, please. Eighth Army Intelligence also noted the difficulties they encountered in trying to evacuate Italians from combat zones because many refused to leave property out of fear of looting, like the Berardis had chosen to do. Many Canadian soldiers found it hard to rationalize the mentality of the Italians considering the war zones that their homes were now placed in. But that was not to say that the Italians' fears were not always unfounded. Many had stores of cured hams, olive oils, and wines in their cellars and believed that once they were away, they became easy pickings. During my interviews with Canadian veterans, some did note that it was not uncommon for them to liberate farm animals, food stores, or tools if they came across them along the front lines to supplement their own rations and supplies. Canadian Army Command had to come to terms with this issue soon after arriving in Italy, as they knew this could impact relations with the support from and uh, relations with the Italian population. Major General Chris Volks of the Canadian Army was quoted as telling his officers that liberating is putting something not too valuable to one's immediate use. If one liberated a goose for the purpose of eating it, all right. If one liberated a carpet for one's caravan, all right. Liberating can become stealing. Stealing is when is the taking of very valuable things from, for personal gain, such as items that you would send home. In the photos, we can see soldiers carrying commandeered furniture in San Vito, which is just south of Artona, Canadian soldiers enjoying wine after the liberation of Artona, and Canadian soldiers with lambs. Now, in some cases, wine and food were freely given to the Canadians, and in other cases, the Canadians did pay for them, and I'll explain how they paid for them later. I asked all the Ortonese that I interviewed about looting, and even though they did reference looting occurring from both sides, they also replied that such things happen in war and that whatever was taken was paid back tenfold in other ways. Next slide, please. Now, the state of the town's buildings and its civilian population was not the only concern. Mines were everywhere and it was dangerous for both civilians and soldiers alike. The Canadian 1st Infantry Division Social Affairs Officer noted in his report on the town that the locals were in a state of dismay after the battle and that the people were on the brink of starvation. In addition, with so many active mines and booby traps around Ortona, it was a dangerous place for both soldier and civilian alike. Tommaso Carancini, who was a ten, 10 years old at the time, remembered seeing his family home in, home in ruins, and the La Basilica San Tommaso, which is the resting place of St. Thomas, destroyed, and he burst into tears at the site. The Canadians didn't take tie, their time in trying to make the town safe for themselves and the locals. They began by clearing mines in and around the town as seen in the photo. They would then take the explosives to a site outside of town to be disposed of. Next slide, please. This was not an easy job. A number of Canadian soldiers were killed during the clearing process. In addition, it was recorded that of the, uh, during the battle, about 1,200 Italian civilians were killed in Ortona and another 200 were killed in and around the town after the battle as a result of mines and booby traps. Lanfranco Berardi lost his father to a mine when he returned to, it, to his fields for work on the land. The photo to the left shows you the variety of mines and booby traps that were found in the area, which included igniting Mark III teller mines with detonators, preset five pound charges, igniting adapted Mark III mines, high explosives, standard Mark III mines, tank mines, wooden box mines, magnetic beehive mines, and Italian box mines. The photo to the left shows war correspondent Paul Morton pointing out a mine right outside an Italian's household. Next slide, please. The soldiers of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division were billeted in and around the town. This became one of the focal points for positive interactions between the soldiers and the local population. This was because a large portion of the soldiers were living in the same buildings as the inhabiting Italians. This provided many opportunities for positive experiences and to recognize the human and personal perspective of war as both civilians and soldiers. 
Such exchanges included cooking meals together, playing cards, and doing laundry for the Canadians, and sharing in the soldiers' rations. Many of the Canadians had not been home to see their own family members in three to four years, and this time with Italian families helped by providing the Italians with opportunities to incorporate the Canadians into their own family. The photo to the, le to the left shows a hand-drawn billeting map for the Prin Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry Regiment in Artona. There was also a level of respect that was noted in interviews with regards to Italian families in the town and the billeting, as well as an official Canadian Army documentation. This respect related to the fact that many Italian men had been taken into custody by the Germans or were still trying to make their way back to Ortona from the various military outposts that they had occupied during their service in the Italian military. This left many Italian households without male patriarchs to provide a level of protection against young soldiers' advances. To avoid complications, Canadian civil affairs officers frequently asked Italian women to leave households in which troops were to billet if they had no male family members who could act as chaperones. Many of these women would go on and live with other family members in the area. The Canadians also established a system of control over the local population. This included special passes for Italians traveling in and out of the town, as espionage was still occurring even after the Canadians took Ortona. An example of the pass that some Italians were given to travel is shown in the photo to the right. It allowed a man by the name of Pietro to travel from San Nicola to Ortona and was issued by the Canadian 48 Highlanders. Next slide, please. The Allied go military government for occupied territories, known as AMGOT, was the form of military rule administered by the Allied forces during and after World War II. This role, their role was to restore law and order, to provide relief to destitute civilians, and to promote military and political objectives of the Allied forces. Specifically, to bring about democratic processes to a country that had been ruled by fascism for 21 years. Within three days after taking the town, food supplies were being provided by the Canadians to the local population as seen in the photo. This had a very, very positive impact on the Ortonesi. Niccolo Paulini noted that he would never forget receiving the rations from Canadian soldiers. Men that had fought against us, against his own countrymen, were freely giving out supplies of food to help everyone in the town. He had one special memory of receiving some chocolates from Canadian soldiers. Francesca Lasorda noted that if it weren't for the rations being given out by the Canadian Army in Ortona after the battle, that many in the town and surrounding areas would have starved to death. Next slide, please. To rebuild the town, the Canadians and Allied military government officials employed locals to clear roads, remove bodies, and set up a variety of services for soldiers and civilians in and around the town. The Allies introduced a new currency for payment called Allied Lira, as seen in the photo. This currency allowed the Allies to employ Italians for all kinds of purposes and provide the Italians with opportunities to earn money and reestablish the economy in their town. Even children could earn a few lira a day by helping clear rubble. Tommaso Cespa noted that he would be paid about five lira a day for clearing rubble on the main roads of the town. His cousin was paid 10 lira a day because he had a donkey and could haul more rubble away. This form of employment meant a lot to the Italians as they were able to reestablish livelihoods, begin to rebuild their homes, and support themselves and their families through work and not charity. The Canadian civil affairs officer also began to introduce democratic policies in the town so the locals could, for the first time in a long time, if ever, appoint representatives for themselves. All former members of the fascist party that were in office prior to the armistice were banned from taking any administrative office until they were educated in the new forms of government being formed. Compensation for damaged possessions was also provided, to a degree through the Allied Civil Affairs Department, although one local, Francesca Lasorda, said it did not always work for everyone because you had to bring your damaged possessions as proof and some people could not find their possessions after the battle amongst the rubble. The Canadians also provided medical assistance to all wounded civilians, with more serious civilian cases being sent to Campo Basso in the south. These actions established an image of the Canadians as compassionate and helpful liberators. Next slide, please. Some of the other services provided by the local population to the Canadians included haircuts, uniform repair, laundry services, working in the mess, and in the provision of local wines and spirits. <clears throat> 
Now, although the selling of wine and spirits had to be controlled soon after Ortona was taken, as there were numerous incidences as a result of overindulging in the local brews, this overindulgence resulted in many barrels of wine being destro destroyed by the military provost, more commonly known as the military police, to avoid violence and drunkenness. In the reports by the military police, Italians were compensated for spirits and wines that were destroyed. In the photos, we can see some of the Italians working for the Canadians in Ortona. I had a good laugh when I found the photo in the middle as the Italian named Leo is actually smoking a cigarette while ironing the Canadian soldier's uniform. It's kind of a very Italian thing to do to be always smoking when you're kind of doing something. Uh, next slide, please. In these other photos, we see Italians providing laundry, shoe shining, and uniform repair services. Uh, next slide, please. But it was not it was not just the billeting of soldiers with Italians and the employment provided by the Canadians that helped build these relationships. Canadian soldiers were not beyond the law, and the locals got to see this firsthand. Canadian soldiers faced disciplinary actions if they broke any laws. This included having to perform heavy manual labor in the town for the locals to witness. Francesca Lasorda stated that when I interviewed her, that it showed a level of mutual respect between the civilian and military populations in the town because everyone was held accountable for their actions. As Ortona began to be rebuilt, the relationships between the Canadians and Ortonese continued to grow. Many Canadian soldiers took Italian la less language lessons in their free time, which was advertised in the Red Patch, which was the first Canadian Infantry Division's newspaper. The billeted soldiers would bring whatever supplies they could get their hands on to their host families, and many soldiers would enjoy just as many meals with their host families as they did in their mess halls that were established in the town. The Ortonese became so close to the Canadians that they donated pieces of a coffin of San Tommaso, the patron state of the town, to Canadians to take home, as the photo to the left shows. Many Ortonese mothers who did the Canadian soldiers' laundry took scraps of the soldiers' clothing and made Canadian army uniforms for their sons to wear and march around in. Lanfranco Berardi, who eventually became a colonel in the Italian army, said the Canadian uniform that his mother made him in 1944 was the first military uniform he had ever worn and left an impression on him. Veteran Farley Mowat said that the casual meals, drinks and conversations between us and the locals of Artona helped recapture memories dimmed by almost four years of absence. There was a level of interdependency between us. Indeed, other veterans like Bill Teleski stated that his relations with his billets helped with his recuperation after the fierce fighting that he experienced on the streets of Artona. By March, I was sleeping a lot better, he stated in an interview. The Canadians did not just set up the town for themselves, but undertook numerous initiatives to support the local population. The photo to the right is one of the first schools for Ortonese children built by Canadian soldiers after the battle, as the original school had been destroyed in the fighting. Next slide, please. The act of remembering the sacrifices of the Canadians did not take years to come about either. From the creation of the regimental cemeteries to the official creation of the Morro River, Cemet River Cemetery, Italians visited the graves of soldiers to pay their respects. We can see in this photo, Teresa Berardi, Lanfranco Berardi's mother, paying her respects at the grave of a soldier of the Royal 22nd Regiment in 1944. Now, after over three months in Ortona in April 1944, the Canadians began to advance beyond the town just before Easter. But by July, some soldiers were provided with a four-day leave pass for rest. It was noted in many soldiers' diaries and military correspondences and in my interviews that a large contingent of soldiers returned to Ortona for their leave, as they had built good relations with the locals. Veteran Maurice White said he was given leave at the end of July 1944 and could have gone pretty much anywhere south of, of Florence, including Rome itself but chose to spend the week with his former billet family in Ortona. When I interviewed him, he said that it was where many of us guys went. It was the closest thing we had to home since signing up for the war. Next slide, please. When the Canadians left Ortona in April of 1944, their divisional newspaper's final issue before the departure stated as follows. In a water of history following a procession of Romans, 
Goths, Normans, French, Spanish, and Germans, the Canadians have now appeared. What will remain behind as a reminder of their passing? Time heals all the scars of Artona, but Artona never forgets. Perhaps our regimental cemeteries will remain there. Perhaps only a name will mark our passing. Seaforth Square, Jasper Avenue, Saskatchewan Drive, or, a, or, it may, or it may be just a battered notice board in a local museum that says you are now entering Artona, a West Canadian town. The memory of Ortona for veterans and the Ortonese has continued to live on. In 1975, many veterans returned to Ortona to commemorate the battle in a major pilgrimage. The photos seen are of locals visiting the Morrow River Cemetery and a veteran of the battle with local children. One former veteran that was present during the pilgrimage was Minister of Veterans Affairs Daniel MacDonald, who was a platoon commander with the Cape Breton Highlanders during the Battle of Artona. He stated, We remember more often than not the hungry people that shared what little pasta or rock-hard bread or eggs they had with the Canadians who had come into their midst. They shared it with the strangers who came to live with them for a time in the presence of death and mutual adversity. And we Canadians likewise shared what we had with them. Over the years, the memories of the Canadians' actions continue to live on in Artona. There are many monuments, including the Price of Freedom statue, Victory Square, and numerous smaller monuments in remembrance of those various regiments that fought inside and outside of the town. There is also the Battle of Artona Museum, where you will still find a very elderly Tommaso Cespa, who continues to tell the stories of the Canadians and his gratitude for what they did for his family and town. Former Canadian ambassador to Italy, Robert Fowler noted during a visit to Ortona in 2008, that the strength of these ties has been evident over the years as many Canadian veterans of the battle have come to consider Ortona as a second home and Ortona citizens as their family. The bonds made in Ortona, forged in war, have now been replaced by that of ongoing mutual commemoration and reflection. And that is how it should be. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zach. That was really interesting. It was really interesting to hear the, the human side and the interactions between the Canadians and the Italians. Um, we do have a few questions for you. Um, the first question um, I'm going to ask is actually my question. Um, one of the most interesting parts um, for me uh, with World War II is the war brides because my grandmother was one. Um, you know, if the, the Italians and the Canadians made such a great connection, um, did we see any war brides out of Ortona after the war? Not out of Ortona. Altogether, there are only 27 war brides that came from Italy altogether. And one oh, of the wow. things that I looked at, because I was kind of curious about that too, because there was close relations, um, like Francesca Lasorda and her sister had close relations with Canadian soldiers. They kind of dated some of the soldiers um, at a time, was that um, military uh, protocol was very, very um, strict regarding Italian and Canadians uh, intermingling, intermingling to the point of war brides. So it was actually the, Itali the Canadian army and their protocols with the Eighth Army that made sure that that didn't happen as much as you'd see like in England or in the Netherlands or even France. Um, so even though there was good relations there, there was they, they did set some pretty strict lines where I even saw documentation where Canadian soldiers had um, started relationships with Italians and wanted to bring their Italian girlfriends home and marry them. And the Canadian government at that time, uh, and especially like the military branches, weren't very accommodating as you, as you could compare to the Netherlands when the Netherlands was uh, liberated. Wow, oh, interesting. Yeah, my grandmother was a uh, Northern Irish. Uh, one of my grandfathers, a guy in his unit, took him home for the weekend. He saw her on the porch, and 11 days later, they got married. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a neat story, and I'm always interested to hear about you know other women that made it back to Canada after the war. Um, perfect. Our next question. Um, so you talked about how the Canadians took Italian lessons um while they were there um, but we do have a question asking about how they dealt with the language barriers um which i guess they would have before they started taking those lessons yeah so what ended up happening was is because it had already been a couple months uh since they had entered mainland italy what the allied government had actually done is they had incorporated um italian police forces specifically a police force known as the carabinieri into their unit as translators. So these policemen, these Italian policemen, they were unarmed, 
um, and they were given some training for like two or three weeks, and then they were kind of put in these positions of um, of, of of translator as well as kind of communicating civil affairs and cultural kind of practices. Because of course, the differences between the cultural practices of the Canadians and the Italians was also very stark. Um, you know, it was interesting. One time I did a presentation at the Royal Military College, and you know, there was a lot of veterans from Afghanistan there, and they were like asking about what the Canadian soldiers' perspectives on the Italian population were. And I said, there, there's a lot of similarities, you know, a lot of a lot of the guys that came from Alberta and Saskatchewan, when they were in the Italian countryside, they were like, wow, these guys are farming like it's 400 years ago. Like they don't even have tractors. They don't have anything. And I'm thinking like you guys are talking from the perspective of farmers in the prairies in the 1940s. And you're saying this is even for the Italians, it was hundreds of years before. So, um, yeah, they, they need they needed the support of the Italian uh, police force to kind of act as translators, but they didn't, like the police, the cabinieri that were in Artona were actually the ones that were uh, surrendered or, or uh, approached to the, uh, the Canadians, were then taken back to allied lines and trained. So that the cabinieri that originally, start, that originally arrived in Artona were actually from areas of like Naples or even as far south as um, uh, uh, Salerno. Um, and they were used until the other Italian cabinieri in the region could be brought up to speed. But all control, policing, and everything else was firmly in the hands of the Canadians. Interesting. Um, our next question is um, what you would say would be the must-visit spots when um, visiting Artona? Wow. Um, there's, there's, there's quite a few. I mean, uh, I, I think it's always really interesting to start off with the Morro River Cemetery, as I said. Um, there are numerous sites south of Artona, from San Leonardo to San Vito to Casa Barardi, where you have other regiments that have specific experiences there. Like the Van Dus didn't fight in Ortona, but the fighting that they did south of Ortona, Casa Barardi, is quite significant. And the Barardi family has donated some land for a monument at the site. On the side of their house, which still stands, there's a monument to Paul, Tri uh, Paul Triquet. Across the valley from, you know, Casa Barardi, there's another individual by the name of Nicola Paulini, and his farm witnessed um, slaughtering pretty much. He was, he was actually in a tunnel with his family, but he witnessed the slaughtering of uh, about 60 soldiers of the West Nova Scotia Regiment. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm hoping he's still alive. He was, he was in his early 80s last time I saw him. But, you know, he usually takes Canadians when they come by to show them the site in the vineyards where the Nova Scotia Regiment uh, kind of ran into a, a bit of a trap which your machine guns is, was mowed down. And, you know, uh, I had a pretty special moment with him. Uh, he has like a wine cellar and he brought me over and he's like, hey, you know, I want you to have some of this wine. And uh, on the wine ball, it says solo per gli amici, which means in Italian only for my friends. And then he got me very emotional. I kind of get emotional talking about it because he was talking about how the wine, um, you know, the grapes that were grown there, the blood of the Canadians in that soil and things like that just really touches you. A um, couple other places, you know, like the the the, the main streets of Artona, definitely, um, you know, there's still a lot of war damaged areas in the town that you can see um, from the battle. Um, a lot of Canadians, you know, we go to the Morro River Cemetery, but we don't go to the civilian cemetery. And, you know, it's really interesting to go to the civilian cemetery too and see the perspective of how many um, how many Italian civilians were killed. I think we kind of forget about that when we look at our own numbers and our own countrymen who, who uh, had to sacrifice. Um, so they have an interesting monument for Italian civilians from the battle at the cemetery. And then there's a bunch of um, a bunch of different other monuments like the, the, the Price of Freedom monument that is a, a very interesting monument. I've only seen one other monument similar to it and that's in Dieppe um, where it's got two one Canadian soldier wounded another one kind of holding him uh, in embrace uh, while that Canadian soldier looks like he's mortally wounded, talking kind of like representing the price of freedom. Um, and then there's Victory Square that was just established a couple of years ago. And that's got one of uh, the, the uh, Three Rivers tanks in it, the former tanks, with, with a number of flags and other representations there. And then I think it's just about walking around the town. Um, you know, you're, you're, I, I speak Italian, so it's a little different for me, but walking around the town and you, you interact with people. And Canadians dress very different from Italians and Italians in Ortona don't get a lot of tourists other than local Italians, um, because they are still a seaside town. They got hotels all along the beach, um, but uh, interacting with them and hearing their perspectives too has been really interesting. And when you go to the museum, there's, you know, I mean, a lot of the younger ones are getting 
the, one, the people that were young during the battle are getting really on in age, but a lot of them volunteer at, at the museum. Like even Francesca Lasorda, she used to go every day for 27 years and place flowers at the Price of Freedom Monument. And then she would volunteer to be like an interpreter and guide at the museum. And Tommaso Cespa did that and a, a number of other individuals that I interviewed. So um, there's lots of opportunities to interact. Um, I'm hoping some of those opportunities continue. Um, COVID, you, you know, you don't, you don't know. I was supposed to actually go, Megan, Megan and I were kind of coordinating a trip to Artona. I was going to take a bunch of my students and a whole bunch of them were quite devastated, not only because of COVID and the trip being canceled, but because they, they thought that, you know, all these people might pass away and we'll never have an opportunity to meet them. So they were quite taken back by it. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully you'll, you'll get a new group of students there <laughs> in the near future. Yeah. Um, we do have another question. Um, so first they're saying thank you for the great presentation. Um, and they wanted to know, um, did you come across any references about reprisals um, by some local Italians after the Germans had been driven out against fellow Italians who had been diehard fascists? You know what, not in Ortona, um, in Campobasso, um, in the Leary Valley, which is where the Canadian uh, First Division Infantry and Second Armored Division went, they did see reprisals like that. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, um, the records that I saw was that a lot of the administrative fascist uh, German supporting Italian population that were in any areas would leave when the Germans would leave. And sometimes the Germans would evacuate them um, to other areas to be used in other administrative supportive roles in their new lines of defense or in the new areas they were in. Um, so in terms of that, like, yeah, like a lot of Italians that were supportive of the Germans or of the fascist government, they didn't really stick around when the Allies got there. Perfect. Uh, and the last question we have, um, I know earlier you mentioned that reading Mark Zolke's book was one of the one of the things that got you uh, into the history here. Um, so uh, we have someone wondering what books you would recommend for students to read um, about the battle. Um, well, there's Farley Mowat's book, The Regiment, um, and he references his time uh, around Ortona and, and the fighting that he participated in south of Ortona. Um, there's the D-Day Dodgers. That's another book that uh, talks a lot about Ortona. Um, it all kind of depends on the perspective you're looking at. I mean, if you're looking at it from the battle, um, the, the official uh, history of the Canadians in Italy is a great, is a great reference. Um, there's a graphic novel too, Ortona, Canada's Battle, um, that's uh, been translated by an Italian. Um, there's also a really good one for teenagers, I find. Like I've, I've shown it to my students where, you know, it, it, it's a graphic novel showing like interactions with Italians fighting the Germans. And, you know, the one thing I've always found difficult even presenting today was, you know, I have thousands of pages of documents and names of regiments and acronyms for different organizations and units and weapons. And it, it can be really overwhelming for students. It can be really overwhelming for adults to even get into. I had to have like a book just translating, even, even though everything was written in English, like what everything meant because there are all these weird acronyms. Um, so I found that graphic novel on Ortona um, really, really interesting for the kids because they can kind of follow along with the pictures, especially like the younger high school students. And then it gives them a little bit of perspective. Great. Well, thank you so much, Zach. Um, this was a great presentation, extremely interesting. Um, you know, I'm, uh, oh, we got one more question. Sorry, we got one more question. So we'll, we'll look at it quickly. Um, so we've got someone wondering if in your research you happened to speak to any German veterans. No, I didn't. Um, I it was it was a real difficult process for me just to get in touch with Canadian veterans and uh, the Italian civilians. Uh, it, it, well, the Italian civilians, I, I ended up establishing a contact, um, and that contact actually just just received um, the material. Mat uh, a civilian uh, award from the governor general, her name's Angela Arone, um, and she's a British Italian and she lives in Ortona, she married an Ortonese, and she's been kind of working with uh, Canadians and the embassy in, Ro uh, the Canadian embassy in Rome, working with like ceremonies and connecting veterans and, and, and Canadians, so she was a huge contact for me. Um, and then I ended up having to try to contact every kind of standing regiment, so like Seaforth Highlanders of Canada and Loyal Edmonton Regiment trying to get a hold of their regimental colonels and say, you know, I know you have veterans that you interact with that were from your regiment. Can you give me the contacts? And some didn't, you know, it, it was a bit of a process even with the veterans, like some didn't want to talk about the fighting. 
Some didn't have a lot of memories with civilians or everything was kind of getting a little faded because they were getting older. Um, and then I kind of looked at it like I just wanted to talk about the interactions with the Italians and Canadians. And I had so much information I ended up getting from those interviews that looking at the German perspective was kind of probably extending me too, too much. At the same time, um, I think it was in 2006, the Germans, um, um, soldiers of the first uh, parachute regiment, I think there was about a dozen of them, and soldiers, uh, Canadian veterans uh, from the Battle of Ortona did meet in Ortona and they did have a ceremony in exchange and they did a little bit of a pilgrimage together for three or four days. Um, and, and there's, there's a, a documentary on that, but I didn't, I didn't have, uh, I didn't interact with any other uh, German veterans though. Well, again, thank you so much. Um, thank you for all the information. I'm sure you could tell us stories for, for hours and hours and hours from everyone you spoke with. Um, it's making me want to go back to our tuna, go back to the museum and see, um, you know, what stories we can hear from the people that work there and the people in the town. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you again so, so much. Um, we hope we'll have people returning to our tuna soon. I'm sure they're, they're missing the Canadians visiting over there. Uh, we have great options for anyone who is interested in traveling over in 2023 and 2024. Um, and then we also have some great Remembrance Day options in Ottawa um, for uh, schools who aren't quite ready to, to travel overseas again. But um, um, as we're we're quickly losing our veterans, it's um, it's very very important that we continue on on our remembrance and um, taking part in in these events. I just yeah. wanted to ask one last question, Zach. I know that you and I had been chatting, um, and you mentioned that uh, there's a really good exhibit. I believe you said in Calgary and also in Ottawa, correct? About Ortona specifically. So um, anyone's there, visiting Canadian sites. Yeah. There, there's a there's a military history museum in Calgary. Um, it's a it's a real mix. It's got Navy and Air Force stuff too, but uh, you know they have a whole bunch of stuff on the Loyal Edmonton Regiment and mouse holing and the tactics. And then there is a designated um, display air like a uh, room just for the Battle of Ortona and the Italian campaign at the Canadian War um, uh, Museum in Ottawa. So you know there's a lot of a uh, lot of things to see there. A lot of um, artifacts and whatnot. Else. Right. All right. Well, thank you again so much. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope everyone has a good day. And uh, for those who attended, uh, thanks for listening. Awesome. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you.